On this Thanksgiving Sunday, are you not thankful for the powerful work of God in your life and the grace that he's granted you by way of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ? Can we just say amen to our God? He is a great God. Alwood Laidman was a pillar in the community I grew up in. He was well respected by everyone. He was a leader in the United Church. He ran a company in Binbrook, Laidman Plumbing. I worked for him for six summers. The last year I worked for him for eight months. I worked in septics and cisterns. I got to clean up, got to dig, got to shovel, got to work in mess sometimes. And he was an honest man. I remember when we'd go out many mornings, he would just say, my name is on your work. If you make a mistake, admit it, right? We'll fix it. But he said, I don't want anything ever buried in anything we ever do that you know is wrong. My name's on it. He was a man of integrity. He was fair. I remember back then, the minimum wage was like four twenty-five an hour. He offered me $6 an hour. My first paycheck said eight. And I said, something's wrong. And he said, you're a hard worker. You're getting $8 an hour. And I was like, well, thank you. And thank you, Lord. But I remember many times driving in his vehicle because I was the summer grunt. And I'd work on Saturdays through the year. I'd come back from Toronto and work a full day Saturday so that I could earn money to go to school and pay for my education so I didn't have to take OSAP. I remember doing that, and as I would be a part of that, we'd have all these conversations. And though he would teach Sunday school and be a leader in the church, and he didn't know the gospel. I remember time and time again, he just didn't know the gospel. We kept touch over the years. Amy and I had him and his wife Betty to our house. God had saved Betty. And they would have us over to their home. They were at our wedding. This lasted for years. And then a number of years ago now, he was passing away in the hospital with cancer. I'd go in to see him. I'd go in to pray with him. And I would talk to him about the things of the Lord, but it just wasn't making sense to him because he thought he was good. He thought he was good. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark 10, beginning at verse 17. Mark 10, beginning at verse 17. The Word of God says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus said. No one is good except God alone. I'll just pause there for a moment. This account is found in three of the four Gospels, not in the Gospel of John, but in Matthew and in Luke. In Matthew, we find he's young. In Luke, he's named as a ruler. So in this passage, in Mark, you don't hear him named as a ruler. We get that from the Gospel of Luke. And so he's a rich young ruler. Now, in this moment, when Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's no one good except God alone. Jesus isn't saying he's not good. Jesus is saying, if you're going to address me as good, don't just do it because somehow you want favor with me. If you're going to address me as good, make sure you understand who I am when you're doing it. That I'm Messiah, the Christ God come down. So when he's saying there's no one good but God alone, Jesus isn't saying, I'm not God, I'm not good. Jesus is saying, if you're going to address me as good, make sure you know why you're doing so. Romans 3 tells us this, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together we've become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Well, verse 19. You know the commandments Jesus said. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher. All these I've kept since I was a boy. Teacher, I've been... Good. I've been good. That's the whole dialogue here. If you miss that part of the dialogue in this text, you don't understand what's happening. The whole encounter here is about a man who's self-assured because of his goodness. And Jesus is trying to point out to him that he's not good. Note verse 21. Jesus looked at him and, say it, and? That's really important. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. 
At this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. You caught it, right? Jesus looked at him and loved him. He didn't say, liar, you can't keep all the commandments. What's wrong with you, man? He didn't correct him. Jesus says, I want you as a rich young man to imagine what life would be like with no money. I want you to imagine what life would be like with no servants, with no homes, with no mansions, with no inheritance, with no money. That all you have is me. And then what does he offer him? Come and follow me. What does that sound like? He offers him the chance to be the 13th disciple. Have you ever caught that in this text? He offers this man the chance to be the 13th disciple. Just like he called the other disciples, come follow me. Just like he called Peter and Andrew, come follow me. And the man turns it down. And he walks away. Notice sad because he had great wealth. You see, his identity had been wrapped up in his money. Tim Keller says this, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart, your imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you only what God can give. Anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would hardly feel worth living. On this Thanksgiving weekend, when you're thanking God for things, is there anything that the Lord could take away this weekend that if you lost, it would feel like you shouldn't even live anymore? Do you treat your car like that? Our associate pastor was on vacation before he started at James North. He found out that his house exploded. The neighbor's house had exploded. It took his out while they were on vacation. If you found out while you're here at West Highland today, your house exploded, would you be okay? Nobody's hurt. It's just a house. It's just a house. If your retirement savings were gone today, I mean, if your spouse passed away today, is, is there anything you idolize? I'm not saying those things wouldn't be hard. But if you feel like they wouldn't be worth living, then is Jesus your centerpiece? Is he truly your savior? Or are you idolizing something else? Are you worshiping something else? Is it hobbies? Is it sports? Is it music? Is it a career? Is it education? You see, what Jesus wanted the rich young ruler to admit was that he wasn't good, that he needed a savior. What Jesus wanted the rich young ruler to admit was, I can't do this on my own. I need someone to help me. He wanted him to be able to admit, I'm not good. Well, Jesus looked around, verse 23, he says to the disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said it again. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Note the first time he says it. He says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The second time he just says how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God, referring to anyone. But then he comes back to the rich again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now just pause here for a moment. What is Jesus talking about? Well, he's talking about a literal camel and a literal needle. That's what he's talking about. Some people will suspect that you can read this stuff where there's some eye of a needle in the Middle East that camels had a hard time getting through, but no one could find that. That's just speculative. We're talking here about a little needle and a camel because Jesus is saying it's impossible to do. You take your biggest sewing needle and you're not going to get a camel through it. Doesn't matter how big that sewing needle is, the camel's not going through. And if you get it through, the camel's not going to be very healthy on the other side. <laughs> because greed captures the hearts of many. Money has a particular way of blinding us, doesn't it? It's hard for others to see it. I mean, often you can see, they can hide it from when someone's an alcoholic, or you know when someone's a liar, but greed is so hard for us to see. Notice verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, then who can be saved? They're amazed twice at these statements because in those days, the people assumed that if you're wealthy, you have God's favor and blessing. If you have money, you have God's favor and blessing. That's what everyone assumed. And you know, in many cultures in our world today, that's what people think. That if someone has money, they have God's favor and blessing. That wealth is this reward from God. 
And the disciples are amazed. Their whole world is just turned upside down because they don't have any way to understand this. This is a concept they've never thought about before. What do you mean it's hard for the wealthy to be saved, Jesus? Aren't they the ones that are closest to God? But he's talking here about the fact that wealth has a particular grip on the human heart. And in our day, a day full of consumerism and materialism, is that not true? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. With God all things are possible. Is that not good news? With God all things are possible. Salvation belongs to him, and he can save anyone. Elwood thought he was good. I remember it was just a couple of weeks before he died, I was sitting with him, and I asked him how he was doing, and he said, I'm scared. Here's a man who used to dig hydro poles, like the, the, the holes in the ground for them, through the frost in the winter with his hands. My grandfather did it too. They told these stories of how they would pick away at, at the frost, and then they would dig, and they would dig down, and they would be paid a dollar a hole. And so the faster you could dig, the more money you could make. Most of us can't even imagine what that would be like, picking away the frost before you even dig the hole. His hands were big, ginormous hands. And I said, why are you scared to die? And he said, I don't, I don't think I've been good enough for God. And I said, Albert, it's not about being good. And I shared the gospel with him. I told him about the hope in Christ. I read passages with him. At the end of our time together, he asked if he could receive Christ as Savior, and he did. The next morning, the chaplain called me from the hospital and said, Dwayne, he said, last night, I want you to know God changed Elwood's life. This morning, the Bible you left him, it's open. He's reading it. He's talking about this peace that he has. I went to visit him over the next couple of weeks. We got to fellowship together. The night he died, he took my hand in his hand, and he said, take care of your family and take care of your church. And he looked at me and he said, I'm not afraid to die. I know I'll see Jesus. I went home that night. He was lucid. He'd eaten a small meal. I didn't expect him to pass away that night. I got home that night. And two hours later, one of his children called me and said, Dad has just passed into God's, into God's presence. And then the United Church, just a couple of weeks later, to a packed out room, I got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone there because God is good. But we are not. Our salvation is found in the hope of Christ, not who we are, not what we've done. Look at this quote from Malcolm Muggeridge. I love this quote. I may, I suppose, regard myself or pass for being as a relatively successful man. People occasionally stare at me in the streets. That's fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admission to the higher slopes of the IRA. That's success. Furnished with money and a little fame, even the elderly, if they care to, may partake of trendy diversions. That's pleasure. It might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote was sufficiently heated for me to persuade myself that it represented a serious impact on our time. That's fulfillment. Yet I say to you, I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs by a million, add them all together, and they are nothing, they are less than nothing, they are a positive impediment measured against one drop of that living water that Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who or what they are. Is that your story? You take everything I have, you take everything I am, you take everything I own, you take it all and you multiply it by a million, and all of that is worth nothing compared to one drop, a crumb at the banquet table, one drop of what Jesus Christ offers. God, you can take it all away. It's worth nothing compared to what I have in you. Nothing compared to what I have in you. So before I go on in the text, I just need to pause for a moment. It's Thanksgiving Sunday. Do you thank the Lord? And do you do it with your money? Do you thank the Lord with your money? In Deuteronomy 26, the word of God says this. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and you take possession of it and you settle in it, take the first fruit of all you produce from the soil of the land your Lord, the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Go to the place the Lord will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come out of the land that the Lord swore 
to our ancestors to give us. And the priest will take the basket from your hands and set it down at the altar. And you will declare, you will testify before the Lord. My father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us. They made us suffer. They subjected us to harsh labor. We cried out to the Lord. The Lord saw our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice. The Lord saw our ministry, our toil and oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arms, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us to this place. He gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I bring you the first fruit of the soil that the Lord has given me. And you place the basket before the Lord. You bow down before him. And you and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given you and your household. Do you bring your first fruits to the Lord? Faithfully. That's any time you have income. Any time you have income, do you bring your first fruits to the Lord? The first thing you should do with any money you receive is you honor the Lord with it. And he says it starts with the tithe. The tithe is all through the Old Testament. God was easy on us. It's simple math. It's actually not hard. 10%. If you have a hard time with it, praise God, there's calculators on our phone. You give it before your taxes are paid. Now, I know our taxes come off automatically. I pay myself now, and my taxes come off automatically. It's the weirdest thing, right? With my business, I, I click the button, and my taxes are already gone. And my wife was like, where have they gone? I said, you don't want to know. Like, it's, it's called the government. Um, but with that said, right, our first fruits off of our growth, it belongs to the Lord. It belongs to Him. And it starts at a tithe, and we move to generous cheerful giving. We teach our children that. We decided in our home when our children would, turn, children would turn 16, we'd open our budget to them and just show them what we make, what we give, what it costs for food, for everything. Why? Because it's our job to teach our kids that, isn't it? It's no one else. Who is going to teach your children to honor the Lord with your wealth, with their wealth, if you don't? Who's going to show them what this looks like? Have you done that with your kids? Have you opened your budget up to them? Have you shown them what you make? I'm, I'm talking at an appropriate age and what you give and what the Lord has entrusted you and why you make those decisions. And the Lord says he longs for us to be generous and cheerful in the New Testament. Generous and cheerful. Do, do you know that according to uh, these analysis, this is from the Fraser Institute, 2022, 19.1% of Canadians give to charity. Only 19.1%, over 80% of Canadians do not give to charity. In 2022, the median Canadian donation, are you ready? Do you see it? Was $340. And the median donation for people making over 150,000 was $820. That's from Stats Canada. First one's from the Fraser Institute. You can just look it up. Now, what are the governments confused? Listen. In the 25 years Amy and I have been married, this does not make us heroic. But likely 15 times the government has asked for our receipts. Last year, this is the first time it happened. My accountant couldn't believe it. They wouldn't even give us our refund back. Normally I get the refund and send my receipts in. Last year they denied, me giving, they denied giving me my refund until I'd given my receipts. They just wrote a letter saying, this doesn't seem plausible. And it was in a year where we needed it. It was in a year when I was between James North and what was next. I was counting on that refund. I knew what came in, and God was like, do you still trust me? Were you trusting the refund or trusting me? We didn't get our refund till August. I submitted it the end of February. I remember being on the phone one day with them, and I'm trying to explain why we give so much to this guy on the phone, and he doesn't understand it at all. And as I'm talking about the Lord and how he changes our heart and changes our view on money and all of this, I asked him three questions. He couldn't answer any of them. And I said, can I talk to a supervisor? And he said, why do you need a supervisor? I said, well, you couldn't answer any of my questions. I'm hoping someone in your office can. Like, why is this happening? I don't understand. I mean, every time I send these in, you say it's okay. But the opportunity for witness, I mean, it was hard. I'm like, Lord, I need to be sanctified on this call. Lord, I need to be sanctified on this call. Lord, I need to be sanctified on this call. This is a witness call, witness call, witness call, witness call. Right? Because at every juncture, when somehow they're doing this, you're like, yeah. Anyway, you get it. You get it, right? Right? 
I'm like, can I have your name and your badge number or whatever it is, your ID number? But what a witness. Could you imagine if every year, every Christian in our nation was audited by the government because it doesn't make sense. They're used to 320 and 820 or 340 and 820. They have, they have no concept of this because the Lord had changed our hearts. What does Jesus say? Where your treasure is, there your, your heart is. So if I could take your bank statements today and your credit card statements and I could flash them up here. I don't have them. Some of you look really nervous. Don't have them, right? But if I could take them and flash them up here, what would it say about your heart today? Would it say kingdom? I mean, I know it's going to say mortgage. It's going to say, I get that. that's all there. But you see, the reason God asked for the first fruits is because it changes the way you live. You have to change the way you live. You see, had they just taken account of what came in, what was good, what was bad, what was there, what wasn't, and at the end, given out of the surplus, well, there's no sacrifice involved with that. But when you give the first fruits, knowing that you're taking the best from the crop that's coming in, not knowing what will happen over the next few days, will there be a hailstorm? Will the end of the crop still be good? You're trusting God for what he's able to do. Some of us still live like that. Some of you in this room, you live off of commission. Right? You, you, you live off invoicing. And you know what you might have this month, but you don't know what you have next month. And God's asking you to trust him with the very first fruits and to start with the tithe, that's 10%, and then to move to generosity. And he wants you to do so cheerfully with this great heart. In fact, he's so serious about it that in 1 Corinthians 5, when he talks about handing people over to Satan, not associating with people who call themselves believers and are acting in certain ways, he says it of the greedy. John preached this back in the fall. Uh, back in the spring, so I'm not going to touch on it. You can read it later today for fun if you want to know who should and shouldn't be handed over to Satan. But, but he says, if, if you're not honoring God with your wealth, you're greedy. And you shouldn't be allowed to associate with other believers until you repent of that sin. That's how serious he takes it. It's the second word he uses in that list of handing people over to Satan in 1 Corinthians 5. In fact, it's so important that in the Gospel of Luke, you find this trend. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 16 if you've got them. Look, what's in Luke 16? The shrewd manager. See, I said this earlier in this series. Sometimes the Gospel authors group things, and they group them by what? By some type of trend, right? So, so, or category. So the rich young ruler is in Luke 16, or the shrewd manager, sorry, Luke 16. The rich young ruler is chapter 17, right? Or, or sorry, Lazarus, the rich man in Lazarus is chapter 17. Chapter 18 is the rich young ruler. Chapter 19 is Zacchaeus. Chapter 20 is do you give taxes to Caesar or not? Chapter 21 is the widow's might. Do you see that? Chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter about money. And it's grouped thematically by category. And he contrasts the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus, I believe. The rich young ruler who walks away sad and Zacchaeus who climbs in a tree to see Jesus, though he's a wealthy man, knowing something's missing. He's a chief tax collector. When the Lord converts him while he's at his house, what happens? Zacchaeus says, I will give half of my positions to the poor. Jesus didn't stop and say, no, only 10%. No, you know, half's too much. I will give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've ripped anyone off, I will pay them back four times. Because today, Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. Is that how you give? Do you give with generous hearts, starting with your first fruits as a tithe and moving to generosity? Do you give here? The tithe should start at your local church. As Amy and I joined, we committed this year that we would give our tithe to James North. Right? I was there 29 years. I've never had a weird year like this. And we would just honor God there. We give more than a tithe, but, but we would give that to James North. But then there's other monies we would give other places. And in January, we would start to give here, right? As, as we're joining here. And it's just as we prayed about it and just thought, Lord, this, so, so you give to your local church. Right? But, but you give to other ministries even in the city. I, I mean, this year, I'll, I'll give it as an example, right? James North is going to do Christmas hampers at Christmas. It's going to cost $40,000. you have heard me talk about this year before. 
They need people in the city that believe in that type of gospel-centered ministry where 300 families are going to be impacted one-on-one to help them. To say, yeah, I can do 50, or I can do 100, or I can do 1,000, or I can do 10,000, because it's $40,000. But then it's around the world. It's Operation Christmas Child. It's Compassion International. It's helping people all around the world as well. But you start with the local. You ask God to grant you opportunity to give from beyond your local church to the city, and then from the city to the world, to everyone. Remember what Jesus said. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. How? Jesus died broke. In fact, Jesus died so broke that he hung on the cross naked. Most of us will not die with nothing. God the Son did. They stripped him. They hung him naked on that cross. They mocked him, they jeered him, they laughed at him. Why did he die on that cross? For our sin, for our greed, for all the other sins we commit. Aren't you thankful that what's impossible for us is possible for God, that salvation belongs to him? And that yet rich young ruler walked away because money was too important to him. I pray on this Thanksgiving Sunday, that if this is an area you've been struggling with, that you come to him in repentance and say, oh God, I have not been honoring you with the wealth you've given me. I've not not been giving you the first fruits. You see, sometimes we make excuses. You know, I'm a student, I'm getting married, I'm buying a house. Oh yeah, that, that must be in Habakkuk, I'm getting married, so I don't have to give to the Lord. Student, that might be in Isaiah. The Bible doesn't give an exclusion clause anywhere. It says if you're a Christian, If you're a Christian, you honor him with your wealth. And while Jesus hung there on the cross and the wrath of the Father is poured out on him and he's dying for our sin, he trusts his Father so much that what does he say at the end? As they've beaten him, as they've mocked him, as the wrath of the Father is poured out on him, as he's naked with nothing, dying broke on the cross, God the Son, what does he say? Into your hands. I commit my spirit because he knew that regardless of what was going on around him, regardless of his circumstance, dying on a cross, he could trust the Father with his being. Do you live like that? That you can trust the Father? Does the way you honor God with your wealth show that week in and week out? I can trust the Father. I can trust the Father. I can trust the Father. Well, remember, Jesus had just said what's impossible for man is possible for God. With God, all things are possible. And then Peter speaks up. We've left everything to follow you, Jesus. We have nothing left. What about us? Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who's left brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me or the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Did you hear that? In this present age, homes and brothers and sisters and mothers, children and fields, note this, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. What is this text about? We're not good. We need the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Money can have a deep grip on the soul of a human being. Don't walk away from God for money. And lastly, did you catch what Jesus is saying? You can't outgive God. Peter says we gave everything, and Jesus says you're right. And you will receive a hundredfold more in this present age, along with persecutions. It'll be tough. And then there's eternal life, where God says what about eternal life? He took the best commodity known on earth that we still measure our economy by, gold. They still talk about the price of gold every day. He took the best economy known to humanity, gold, and he says it's going to be the asphalt of heaven because it only gets better from there. Is that not great news? God says, you want to know what I have in store for you? You want to know what I'm going to do in glory? 
God says, this is how much you can trust me. I'm going to take the best thing you've got on planet Earth. You're going to walk on it in heaven, and it's only going to get better from there. Is that not great news? And Jesus Christ will be its centerpiece where there'll be no death and no disease and no cancer and no heartache. You'll never be tempted again. Temptation will never enter your mind again and we'll worship him fully forever and ever. Amen. I remember when Rick came to faith in Christ, I've told you his story from a Buddhist home. His mom wouldn't come to the baptism. Some of his friends came, they were Buddhist and Muslim. And he talked about how he thought his athleticism would fulfill him, but it wouldn't. And his academics would fulfill him, and it wouldn't. And how he thought being really good looking would fulfill him, but it wouldn't. And he found the only thing that would fulfill him was Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks after his baptism, he and I were out talking. And he looked at me and he said, I got something I didn't think, I didn't understand I would get with the gospel. He said, I knew I would get Jesus. And he looked at me and he teared up. He said, I didn't know I'd get family. I didn't know as this, he didn't say it quite this way, but as this young guy from a Buddhist home who knows no one in your church, I didn't know people would welcome me in. I didn't know people would care for me. I didn't know people would come and disciple me. I knew I would get Jesus. I didn't know I would get his family. Stand up, just stand up, stand up, stand up. Right now, just stand up, wherever you are. Look around you. Look around you, Asina. Look around you, turn around. Turn around and look. Turn wherever you are and look. This is uncomfortable, I can tell. Turn around and look. Look, this is your family. Praise the name of the Lord. These are your brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. This is your spiritual family in Christ. It's a hundredfold anything you have left because our God is that good. You can sit down. Is he not a great God? And so who are you inviting into your home? Who are you welcoming? At at the membership meeting, there was a young man this week. He might be here right now. I don't know. He told the story of coming to faith in Christ. As far as I know, he's the only one from his family. I thought, who's discipling him? Who's coming alongside of him? Who's welcoming him in? Oh, it's good news, isn't it? The gospel of Jesus Christ. It's so good that when someone comes from a Muslim home or a Buddhist home, or an atheistic home, and they show up here and they think all they get is Jesus, that you can put their arm around them and say, oh, I know you've left a lot behind. Let me show you what you're going to get. And you show him this group and you celebrate with him or her the goodness of our God and not only his salvation, but a welcoming as a son or daughter into the family of God. Amen? You can't get to heaven because you're good. I can't. I need to trust in the goodness of God. Money, oh Lord, may it not have a grip on my soul. May I be generous in the way I take what you've given me and grant it back to you. And maybe even this morning as we close in song, some of you need to go online and you need to sign up for direct deposit here at West Highland. You need to go on an e-transfer. You know what I wonder? I wonder if the number of us who haven't been faithful and honoring God with our fruits, first fruits and tithe here at West Highland, if we did that this week for 2023, if we did that this week for 2023, I wonder if God would just pay off this mortgage. I bet you it's that kind of money. That would not surprise me. And thirdly, as you consider that this week, you can't outgive God. You can't. You can't outgive him. He grants you a family. And yes, persecutions. But one day eternity. Where the streets are paved with gold. And Jesus is its centerpiece. Amen? Jesus Christ, we come before you today and we confess that we rely on our goodness. And we can't. Oh, would we rely on your goodness and point others to your goodness? And we confess that in a day where every commercial, every ad is about buy and purchase and own, oh, may our first fruits belong to you, God. We repent of that sin. May our first fruits belong to you. May we start with a tithe and then may we move to a generous place. And may we see in our lives, God, that Your kingdom cannot be outgiven. You cannot be outgiven because you bless us with family and your own presence and one day eternity. 
So as we face persecutions, as your son did, as we may end up with nothing as he did, may we know that into your hands we can still commit our spirit because we can trust the God who has saved us. And God's people said? When God called the Israelites to come and give, they stood in front of the priest and gave testimony of the faithfulness of God. Oh, every time you give to him, may you give testimony to the faithfulness of God. Amen? Amen. Listen to this as our closing prayer, because sometimes you hear these words, and for me, for you, they're overwhelming. Would you hear this from Ephesians chapter 3? Paul says, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he would strengthen you with his power through the Holy Spirit in your spirit so that Christ would dwell, would feel at home in your heart through faith. And I pray that all of you who are rooted and established in love, that you may have power together with all of God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for you. And to know that love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than anything you could ask or imagine, because it's according to God's power that it's at work within you. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and for all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving and have a great day in the Lord.